Well, good morning. As I begin today, I just want to say a, a second thank you to all of you who came and served and blessed our community. It is our hope as a church not to just gather here weekly, but to go out and be the church in our community. And many of you, you served really, really long hours last night. A lot of people, you went above and beyond. And I just want to say thank you. I want to celebrate that 1,500 people were served by you guys, that people came through and they saw the love of Christ, the gospel was shared. I believe God was glorified, and so uh, I just want to say a word of thank you once again to all of you who served and helped plan, and those of you who give to make these things uh, possible. Uh, it was just a, a really wonderful night last night. Our Pecola campus uh, hosted their own uh, fall event, and several people in the community were calling and saying, hey, can I be a part of what you guys are doing? And so our church is being light in the darkness, and I, I believe that God is proud and God is honored by you guys. So I want to say thank you again. Now, if you weren't here last week, we have begun a new series called The Five Solas. These are kind of the five core doctrinal things that emerged out of what is known as the Protestant Reformation around the 1500s, where men and women decided they were going to come back to the Bible and say, if we're going to be Christians... If we're going to call ourselves Christians and followers of Jesus, we are going to actually follow Jesus. And so they sought to look back to the scriptures and say, what, what are we really supposed to do as disciples, as believers in Jesus Christ? How are we supposed to live? They kind of knew what they'd been taught, but they looked back at the scriptures and some of these core doctrines emerged. So the first one was Sola Scriptura um, that says that scripture alone is our supreme authority for our life and our faith and our practice. We're going we're gonna to let the Word of God trump our thoughts and our feelings and our emotions even. We're going to let the Word of God trump uh, tradition of the old church. We are going to look to the Scriptures and say, what should we believe? How should we behave? And Scripture is the primary source of our authority. Now, this week... We're going to take on the second sola. These are not in any particular order. They didn't like emerge all at one time. They just kind of grew out of this Reformation movement, looking back to the Word. What should we believe? How should we behave? The second one is that of sola gratia. It means by faith or by grace alone. That's next week is faith alone. By grace alone. So here, here's the idea. You and I are not saved on the basis of our merit. So what, what didn't happen is God didn't look down at the world and be like, you know what, I think I want him. He's, he's really intelligent. She has good hair, and this one's going to live really well. Like, I'm going to save those people who somehow have um, earned some merit in the sight of God. Um, that's not what happened at all. But rather, you and I are saved solely on the basis of God's grace alone. Like, it wasn't because you were going to be a, a super great Christian. Well, I hope you are. It wasn't because you were going to be the greatest giver in the history of the church. Go get that too. It wasn't because you were going to share the gospel more than somebody else. It wasn't because you were maybe just a better person or overall like had more to add to the kingdom. That's not why God would save you. That God has chosen to save us on the basis of His grace alone. Today I've got two things to do to you, uh, or to teach or speak to you. The, the first is that i, I got to deliver some, some bad news, and then the second, I'm going to deliver some good news. You know, you eat your vegetables before you eat dessert, right? So that's kind of what we're going to do. And so uh, the bad news is, is, first of all, about your sin. Like, we've got to have a talk. I don't know if your parents ever set you down when you were young, and, and like they had this knowledge that that you also had, but you were, didn't think that they knew um, that you had gotten into some trouble, right? And they're like, they sit you down and they're like, you have anything you need to tell me? It's like the worst question ever as a kid. You're like, of course I do. I've got like 10 things. I need to know which one specifically I need to relay to you right now so I don't get in even more trouble. Well, there's a lot of trouble to be had in our lives because we are pretty good sinners, if you've been around church very long, you're going to recognize the next verse I'm going to read for you. If you're new to the faith, I would want you to know this about yourself. This is a very simple verse. Romans 3.23, the Apostle Paul writes to the church at Rome, and he wants them to know that for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Now, this word sin, it means to miss the mark. 
So you think like an archery term, you got a target, you got a bullseye. And to sin means to miss the mark. And oftentimes when we think about our sin or we think about ourselves in the sight of God, we think, yeah, I, I did miss the mark. Like I was a little off in the way I said that. Like I was um, maybe not as gracious as I should have been. I did some things as a kid. And we see ourselves as kind of narrowly missing the mark that God would have for us. But Paul says, for all sin and fall short of the glory of God. And when you think about God and his glory, God, he's all-powerful, he's all-knowing, and he is perfect in all of his ways. Perfect in righteousness, in his holiness, in his justice. He is perfectly good. His love is perfect. Can I submit to you that we didn't narrowly miss the mark, but rather that there is a vast gap between us and us. And God, I'm going to hopefully convince you of that over the next few minutes. You see, in Romans 3, Paul didn't just say that we've all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Uh, He wanted to relay even more. He's going to quote a lot of Old Testament scriptures to, to lay that case on our shoulders a little more heavily, if you will. Romans 3, verses 10 through 18, they say this. There is none righteous, not even one. There is none who understands None who seeks for God, all have turned aside. Together they have become useless. Not super useful, right? Out here killing it for God, we have become useless. There is none who does good, not even one. Their throats are an open grave. With their tongues they keep deceiving. The poison of asps is on their lips. Their mouths are full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their paths. And the path of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Here's the thing. We didn't just kind of fall a little short, miss the target by just a little. What the Apostle Paul would would say to us is that we are wicked, total, and completely sinful before God. All of us have sinned and fallen short, and not just a little short, like there is a vast chasm between us and God. Now, sometimes we think about our our sinful actions, and we know there are times when we sin. Uh, Last night when we got home from the the fall roundup, I went home and I put a bunch of meat in the smoker because uh, yesterday was my youngest son, Luke. It was his seventh birthday, and we're having the birthday party this afternoon. So put the meat on the smoker the night before, and I got to be honest, y'all, uh, I had to sit and watch it just for a while, but I got the temperature just right. I got up this morning, smoker still at 225, and I was really excited. So one of my pieces of meat was just exactly where it should have been, so I went ahead and took it out, and, and I knew the, the larger piece was going to take a while longer. And so I went out this morning, I got completely dressed for church, and I'm like, I need to check that temperature one more time, I don't want the meat to get overdone, and so I went out to the smoker with my meat thermometer, and it's, it's done. It's time to pull the, the bigger chunk of meat off the smoker, it's going to be uh, ready, I don't need to cook it anymore. And as I was ever so carefully removing the meat from the smoker, I splattered juice all over my shirt that I was going to wear to church. Uh, I poured it all over my shoes. I was uh, a, a pretty big mess. And then I come in the house, and I realized that I forgot to tell my wife that the first piece of meat that I took out was in the oven where I was just going to kind of let it rest for a while. And she had preheated the oven, um, and so it was like 350 degrees, and my meat is, is drying out. And I got to be honest with you all, I threw a fit in my kitchen this morning. I like screamed. I was like, oh, I was so frustrated. And my, my seven-year-old, he laughed at me. Like, I was so childish that even my seven-year-old was like, Get it together, Dad. So here's the thing. When we blow it and have to apologize for our behavior to our seven-year-olds because we acted like a five-year-old or so, uh, oftentimes we're like, oh, that was sinful, right? Like we know. Um, you could probably think about times in your life where you've kind of blown it in fairly epic fashion. You have really made some big mistakes. But can I tell you just, uh, and, and hear this gently, a little more bad news? We're going to get to the good very soon. Isaiah chapter 64, verse 6, says this about you. That not just in your good moments have you fallen short, but even in your, or not just in your bad moments have you fallen short, but even in your best of moments 
you've fallen short. Isaiah 64, 6 says this, For all of us have become like one who is unclean, and all of our righteous deeds. You know that thing you're kind of proud of? The person you helped, the good thing you did, right? Like where you thought, I'm a good member of society, I'm doing my duty, right? I gave the money, I did the thing. All of our righteous deeds are like a filthy garment. So here we stand before God. All of us have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Even on our best day, that thing we were most proud of was tainted by sinful motives or maybe even sinful behaviors. And when we stand before God, when God would just kind of look at us, we don't have anything to offer him. When God would look at us, there's only sin. That's all we bring to the table. When we think about how we relate to God, there's only sin. Now, you all know about the scale idea. This is how many people think about God and think about salvation. Many people think about like their salvation in terms of a scale. It's like a balance, right? So you have your good works on the one hand and your not so good works, you miss the mark, the sinful things on the other, right? And so if your good works outweigh the bad works, then you're going to be acceptable before God. Now that Listen, this is a pervasive idea throughout the South and really all of American culture, thinking about God. If my, my good outweighs the bad, then surely God's going to accept me. The problem with that, again, is that in our relationship with God, we only have bad works. The, the scales tilt in, in the direction of our, our bad works. As a matter of fact, even our righteous acts are like filthy rags before a perfectly holy God. There's no good to tilt the scales back in our favor. Romans chapter 6, Paul continues. He tells us that we are slaves to sin. We are shackled by sin. We're in bondage to sin. We're obedient only to our sinful and wicked Desires. Martin Luther, one of the, the uh, fathers of the Protestant Reformation, he wrote a book called The Bondage of the Will about how before Christ we are enslaved to sin and we can do no other. Now I'm going to get to our primary text today. One more little bit of bad news and then we're going to get to the good stuff. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Ephesians chapter 2. Y'all, you weren't just sinful in your bad things you weren't just sinful in your good things. Your condition was even a little worse than you might have thought. When it comes to your life before God and trying to do righteous things or follow after God, uh, Paul writing to the church at Ephesus, he would say this about you. He says, And you were dead in your trespasses and sins. You weren't like sort of alive to save yourself. Like you weren't up and going and thinking, you know, I'm going to earn something before God. I'm going to work my way out of this situation. You were dead in your trespasses and sins. Like your spiritual heart wasn't beating. You couldn't respond to God. You couldn't hear God. You couldn't like somehow honor God with your life. You were dead in your trespasses and sins. He says, in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world. You were just like everybody else here, following the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. Lest any of us be kind of prideful as believers in Christ, he says, among them we too, we all formerly lived in the lust of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest of the world. And so here's where we were before God. Here's what we deserved before God. We were utterly sinful in all of our ways, like wickedness and rebellion and shaking our fist in the face of God, saying, no, no, God, I know the right way. I'm going to go make my own path. I'm not going to be obedient to you. 
And the scriptures say you were dead in trespasses and sins, an object of wrath. That's what we merited. That's what we deserved. But there are two powerful words coming up in this passage that change everything for us. In verse 4, it says, But God. But God. Uh, remember, we're dead, right? We're not like partnering with God to do some good works. Like, hey, God, if you'll, go, you'll go this far. I'll meet you in the middle. God, I'm going to take these steps towards you. No, no. We were dead in trespasses and sins, enslaved to sin. We could do no other but God. There's, there's two concepts. Um, the first is that of synergism. This is a belief among uh, many in Christianity, again, particularly in the South, that we, we kind of lock arms with God. You know what I mean? Like at some point, I decided I was going to start living for the Lord. I was going to find Jesus, right? And so we kind of think that, you know, we got up and we partnered with God to start living a better life, doing a better thing out there, right? I'm going to be a, a pretty good guy or a pretty good gal. I'm going to start living for the Lord. Now, if, if, if you desire to live for the Lord, I, I think that's fantastic. But what you need to know is that at no point in the process of salvation did you partner with God. In that partnership, all you brought was your sin. You were dead in that sin. It was God alone, a concept known as monergism. It was God alone who acted in your salvation. We were dead, but God. Here's what it says about him. But God, being rich in mercy... Because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, he made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. And he raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the ages to come he might show the surpassing riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that nobody can boast. You and I, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ here today, you were saved by grace alone. God's grace alone. So think about this. You're, you're in God's position here. You create the world. Um, it is full of people who have chosen to day after day after day, rebel against you. They're living lives of wickedness, living lives of destruction, devouring one another. All of the sins that you can list, that's what the world was doing against you, day after day after day. Now, if I'm God, I don't look down and think, I'm going to save those people. But our God is different. The love of our God far exceeds the love that we can know as like humans apart from God, right? His love is so extraordinary. The nature of God, the way that he would view humanity through the lens of his love and his grace would incline him that when we were objects of wrath and deserving of destruction, God would send his own son to endure that wrath for us that he might save us from the wrath that we deserved. Now, y'all know the Old Testament. Old Testament sacrificial systems, the Old Covenant. Every year on the Day of Atonement, it was known as Yom Kippur. The Jews still celebrate this today. Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. What would happen um, was for the sins of the people, they would bring in a pure, spotless lamb. Think about this. Like, this is your kid's lamb. Been caring for it, rearing this lamb, raising it up. And on the Day of Atonement, you take this pure, spotless lamb, and they would slaughter it in front of all the people. Like you would watch as it's breathed its last breath. The lifeblood drains out of this pure, spotless lamb. It seems kind of a, like a gory thing, right, to make your kids watch like, and to celebrate what's happening here as a lamb is slaughtered and divided up and all the things that would happen. I want you to know that my sin 
and your sin, it was costly. If you would have been there at the Old Testament sacrifice, you watched that little lamb die, you would have realized that your sins were costly. But then we remember that under the New Covenant, we don't do Yom Kippur every single year. We remember that Jesus went to the cross, that God took his own son, and he offered him up for us. His blood was shed. Jesus endured a brutal beating. He spat in his face and drove a crown of thorns into his head. They mocked him. They beat him beyond recognition, even by his own mother. Imagine being there and witnessing the man spread out. And they began to drive the nails through his wrists and his ankles. Imagining seeing him lifted there up, his chest heaving, trying to draw in a breath, suffering and dying there. Our sin was costly. And yet God loved us so much because of his mercy and the great love with which he loved us. He sent Jesus to die in our place that we might experience this grace. As Brandon said, grace is God's unmerited favor. We didn't deserve that. But God freely gave his son, Jesus, to endure the punishment that we deserve for our sin, to die as an atoning sacrifice for us. Some of you, when you think about God, you think of him as an angry or a distant or an uncaring father. He's probably just kind of mad at you for all of your sin and all the things that you've done wrong. Maybe he's disappointed in you. Today I want you to see that when God looks at you, he looks at you with an attitude and a heart of grace for you. With a heart that loves you enough to send the pure spotless lamb of Jesus Christ to the cross. That you wouldn't have to stay in your sin. That you wouldn't have to endure the, the consequences that you deserved. But instead that you might find a new life in him. That is by God's grace alone. That grace didn't come cheaply. It came at the cost of God's only Son. But God freely gives grace as a gift to us. See, the Christian life, it, it begins as an act of God's grace. But... God, he acts on us when we're, we're dead in trespass and sin. He acts for us to make us alive together with him because of his great love for us. God acted that we might no longer be under the weight of sin, but we might find a new life in him. And here's the thing. Just as your Christian life, if you're a believer here today, just as your Christian life originated in God's grace, just as you're like your beginning of your faith happened because of God's grace, your Christian life should animate or should continue in God's grace. So look here in verse 7 of Ephesians chapter 2. It says that Jesus raised us up with him in the, in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that in the ages to come he might show the surpassing riches of his grace. So like he didn't just give you enough to save you, right? He didn't just give you enough like, okay, you're, you, you're going to make it to heaven. Like you're going to be there. You're going to be okay. Keep reading with me. So that he might show the surpassing riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one can boast. But look here in verse 10. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. Listen, the grace of God doesn't just save you from your sin. The grace of God begins to empower all of the rest of the work of God that he wants to do in and through your life. So I want to talk about, just for the next couple, minutes beyond salvation 
Like, if you're here today and you don't know Jesus Christ, you've never entered into his grace, like, I, we, we're going to give you a chance at the end of the service to, to trust him and to, like, to, we'll pray with you. We'll kind of walk with you through what it means to be a believer. But before we go, I want to point out what are these abundant riches for those of us who have come to faith in Christ, you've experienced salvation. What do the riches look like for us? Number one, the surpassing riches of his, of his grace. Number one, we find grace to help us in our time of need. I don't know what season of life you're walking through, where the difficulty may be for you. Maybe this is just an awesome time and life is good. But we all know that we go through difficult seasons. And God gives us grace to help us in our time of need. This is Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16. The writer of Hebrews says, Therefore, let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in our time of need. We don't deserve to get to come before God, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, who is perfect in righteousness and holy. Like We don't deserve that, but God invites us to do that. Your Heavenly Father wants you to come to Him in the time of need. And we come with confidence because we're approaching a throne of grace. And God gives His grace richly to help us in our time of need, whatever that may look like for you right now. Maybe it's illness. Maybe it's grief. Maybe it's a season of depression for you. God would want us to boldly or with confidence approach the throne of grace, that we might receive help in our time of need. Number two, God gives us grace to help us in our weakness. Because here's the thing. When we got saved, we didn't miraculously like have this body transformation like what happens to, to Superman, right? When it, like, uh, like the cape comes on and all of a sudden we get saved and we've now got all this supernatural power in ourselves to, to begin to live these victorious Christian lives. That's not how this works. Like if you, even if you're a believer today, your flesh is still weak. Maybe you're here and you still struggle with that sin. It's ongoing, and it's a weakness, and it's frustrating. Maybe you look at yourself and you're like, ah, I just don't have what it takes to live this life of these good works that Jesus has prepared for me in advance. I sure don't feel like God's workmanship. The Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 9 and 10, he was talking about the thorn in his flesh. I don't know if you've ever had a thorn like in your foot or something, but when you walk, it's a pretty good limp. You know what I mean? Like you, you, you know it's there the whole time. It really inhibits what you would otherwise want to do. The Apostle Paul said he had a thorn in his flesh. Now, we're not told if this is sin or just some other level of weakness. Maybe it was like a physical struggle. But he prayed three times, God, would you take this away from me? And God didn't take it away. But the Apostle Paul says this. He said, and he has said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. For my power is perfected in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, I would ra will rather boast about my weakness so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. Can I just speak that over you today? For you in the midst of your weakness, and you're thinking, God, I'm not sure I'm, I'm prayerful enough. I'm not sure I read enough. God, I don't, I'm not sure I know enough. God, I'm not sure I have what it takes to be like this person who, who's going to fulfill your good works. God's grace is sufficient for you. And it is in the midst of your weakness that God wants to pour out his grace on you, his power being perfected in the midst of your weakness. So God gives grace to help in our time of need, and he gives grace to help us in our weakness. The final thing here is he gives us grace to help us Grow. Again, the Apostle Paul, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 9 and 10. Paul, the Apostle Paul says this, For I am the least of the apostles. He's like, guys, I don't, I don't belong in league up there with Peter and James and John. Like, I'm the least of the apostles, and, and here's why. I'm not fit to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. If you know the life of Paul, he was a, a zealous Pharisee that would get letters from the chief priests and go throw men and women in prison for following after Jesus. 
He stood by holding the coats of men as they bashed a believer with rocks until he died. After coming to faith in Jesus, he looks back on his life and he's like, I'm not worthy to be called an apostle. And I'm not where they are. Like those guys who followed Jesus from the beginning. No, no, no. I, I opposed Jesus from the beginning. I'm not on their level, if you will. I'm not fit to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace toward me did not prove in vain. But I labored even more than all of them. He's like, I worked harder than even all the apostles. Like, you look at the apostle Paul. He wrote two-thirds of the New Testament. He's the reason that the gospel spread around the known world. He was the apostle to the Gentiles. Like, we can sit here today grateful for the work that God did through the apostle Paul. He's like, God's grace did that in my life. Look what he says here. His grace toward me did not prove in vain, but I labored even more than all of them, yet not I, but the grace of God within me. Maybe as you sit here today, you feel like the apostle Paul, and you're like, Jason, you don't know about my past. Man, you don't know how bad that sin was. You don't know where I've been or the things that I've done. Hey, Jason, I, I don't know the word. I wasn't raised in church. Man, I don't have what everybody else has or something deficient in me. Listen, we have the grace of God to help us in our time of need, to help us in our weakness, and the grace of God to help us grow. You see, God did a powerful work in the life of the Apostle Paul. He couldn't see for three days. It was this really powerful process in him. But God took this man who once started at a deficit. He was busy persecuting the church, putting believers to death. And God, in his grace, grew Paul, transformed Paul, and led him to lead unbelievers to life. And so for you, I don't know what your kind of fill-in-the-blank excuse is, Hey, God, I'm not really sure that I can do these good works. I'm not sure I can walk in the good works that you prepared for, before me. Like, God, I'm not sure that I, I'm really your workmanship. I'm, I'm way behind. Listen, it is the grace of God that helps us grow. It's, it, Matt Chandler talks about this phrase. It's grace-driven effort where we open up the scriptures and we say, God, would you give me a hunger for your word? We begin in prayer. God, would you help me to pray? Prayer as, as I should. Would you teach me what it means to pray? God, would you teach me how to walk in the disciplines? God, would you begin to use the gifts that you've given to me? Listen, I feel like the Apostle Paul. I feel like I don't belong here, and I know I can't do this. But God, would you give me grace to help me grow? And would you use me to accomplish every single good work that you prepared for me in advance? It's by grace alone that we come to faith. Christ. It's by grace alone that we come to salvation. And it's by grace alone that we grow in what's known as sanctification, where we live out this Christian life and we walk as disciples of Jesus. It is by his grace alone. Today, we're going to have a time of response. And I'm going to invite you to do one of four things today. As you, you sit here and you've heard about the grace of God poured out for you, if you remember that you have nothing to bring to your relationship with God besides your sin, but God met you there anyway, that God chose to save you. If you're here today and you've never come to faith in Jesus Christ, like today is the day of salvation. Today is the day that God is waiting to pour out his grace upon you for you to begin to walk in this abundance and this newness of life where you're made alive together with him, where your spiritual eyes are open, your spiritual ears begin to hear. Like if that's you, we're going to have an invitation in just a couple of moments. Like I would love to share with you. I'll be right down here in the front. There will be people right next to you in the rows that would love to share with you. You can find one of our staff members afterward. But today is a day where you can receive this abundant grace of God. Now, if you're here and you're a believer in Jesus, and you find yourself in a time of need, I mean, it's loneliness, it's grief, sickness, whatever it might be, would you spend the next few minutes approaching with confidence the throne of grace that God may give you grace to help in time of need? If you're here today and you just feel weak, God, I can't. I'm not, I don't have anything in and of myself to do what you would have me to do. Would you be as Paul 
And just see that God's grace is sufficient for you to accomplish everything that he wants to accomplish for you. And finally, if you're here today, you think I could never live for the Lord. I'm too far gone. My, my cause is kind of lost. I, I've sinned too much. Would you just pray that God would give you the grace to begin growing and maturing in him, that he might use you to accomplish his purposes? Would you bow with me? Lord Jesus, we are so humbled by your grace. And Lord, we ought to be the most humble people on the planet because we have the God of the universe that has entered into a relationship with us when we only brought sin to the table. God, may that truth make us loving and accepting of everyone who is around us. And the way that we choose to extend grace and mercy to others, may that be true of us because we've received that from you. Lord, for the person in this room that doesn't know you, I pray that today would be the day of salvation for them. For the person who hasn't grown in their sanctification, who hasn't grown in their walk with you, I pray that that would be enabled and empowered by grace today. And I pray it in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.